it's, it's a great pleasure to be here, and uh, it's a, uh, also traveling on uh, such a lovely day. Finally, we don't have snows anymore, mm -hmm. and uh, I don't know how much you got. I heard that they mostly missed you and came to us, so <laughs> we, we took a heavy hit this, uh, this uh, winter. So, so, yeah, so what I want to share with you today is primarily on a super resolution imaging method that we developed, STORM. But uh, there's some new excitement that doesn't have much to do with STORM. So I actually, uh, uh, that was just published uh, two days ago. So, so I actually squeezed my uh, her, uh, you know, STORM part of the talk to, uh, to fit that last part A that has to do with uh, transcriptome imaging. So I hope you'll be uh, interested. So we know that uh, you know, cells you know, are made of uh, many, many molecules and then uh, many different types of molecules. And these molecules, uh, you know, even the biomacromolecules such as uh, protein, RNA, and DNA, they're generally pretty small on the nanometer scale size. And then uh, they really interact in very intricate way in many different networks and together give the cells life. So obviously, if you want to study the system using a visualization approach or imaging approach, then you could imagine that you would want your imaging technology or method to have these properties. Now, because you would like to, or uh, not everybody would like to, but we would like to understand things at the molecular level to see how these molecules interacted to give the function. So then uh, we would want our imaging approach to have the molecular scale resolution which means nanometer scale resolution because the molecules are nanometer scale. And also because there's so many different types of molecules uh, in, in, inside the cell, and then when we image them, we would like to have their identity. You know, we would like to know that this is acting, this is uh, this kinase, uh, this is a nucleosome, and then all these things. So we would like to have the molecular specificity in our images. And finally, because uh, these are biological systems, uh, you know, before we kill them, they're alive. So, <laughs> so uh, there are many changes in dynamics and motions that are going on in these systems. So, so we would also like to have dynamic imaging capability. So with that in mind, if you uh, look back to all the uh, imaging modalities that exist, and then you found that one imaging modality does pretty well, at least on two fronts, classically or traditionally, and that's fluorescence microscopy. Because uh, uh, fluorescence, uh, we know there are so many different kinds of fluorescent probes, like fluorescent proteins, fluorescent dyes, or even inorganic probes uh, like uh, quantum dots and so on. And then these probes, uh, there are also many, many different uh, biochemical approaches that have been developed to link these probes uh, to our target of interest inside the cell with explicit specificity. So when you combine that, then you can use multicolor imaging to actually encode the molecular specificity in, in your sample. And then another thing is a light microscopy generally is, uh, is, uh, is not zero perturbation, but it's a relatively low invasiveness. So you could use that actually to look at dynamic uh, dynamics inside a living system and without worrying too much about perturbation. Actually, generally, we do have to worry about light-induced damage. But in principle, <laughs> it is possible, if you're careful, to actually minimize that to reveal the endogenous dynamics. However, uh, traditionally, light microscopy didn't do so well in the nanometer scale resolution front. And that's uh, because in a simple way of speaking, when you focus light, the focal spot has a finite size uh, that relatively drawn to scales like this compared to the nanometer size molecules. And that physical, uh, the physical principle of it is a diffraction. Because light is a wave and then has its subjective diffraction, and if you want to localize light, for example, if you want to find an objective that has a very high numerical aperture and then try to focus it to a tiny spot, no matter how hard you try, the spot nonetheless has a finite size. And this size so was the best objective that you can found is about 200 nanometer in this uh, lateral directions and nearly a micron along this direction that light propagates. So if you use such a spot to scan your sample, even the smallest feature will be broadened by the spot. 
Now, uh, that's why uh, these, the, the, these spots are also called point spread function, because even a sizeless point, their image will be spread out into that size. Now, if you have these features so widely separated, you know, you can still resolve them. But if you move them closer and closer together, <coughs> eventually you reach a point where the distance between these two features are actually comparable to the size of the point spread function. So in that case, their image will overlap in such a severe way that you only see a single blob out of these two features. There's not even a uh, sort of a dimple or a, or a dip in the middle. So that's when you are no longer able to resolve them. And that was originally recognized by Ernst Abbe uh, in 1873. So that's also why it's called the Abbe resolution limit. So if you recapitulate this part, we have this diffraction limited resolution of a few hundred nanometers, and we would like to get to molecular scale of only a few nanometers. So there's a two, two orders of magnitude gap. And that two orders of magnitude gap is what we would like to close. And uh, what I'm gonna give you today is just a progress towards closing the gap. And in general, we have not closed that gap yet. So uh, even though uh, we're moving much closer to the, to the goal. So, so now we know that there are generally two types of approaches that to, uh, as is actually probably an old way of speaking, you know, because there are more than two types of approaches. But uh, you know, uh, at the beginning, you know, there are about two types of approaches of, uh, of, uh, of a method that could break the diffraction limit. And uh, one of them is using pattern illumination to actually effectively shrink this point spread function of, uh, of the light microscope. And uh, uh, representative approaches is the, you know, the famous example of the sti stimulated emi emission depletion microscopy step or its generalized form resolved to microscopy pioneered by uh, Stefan Hell and coworkers. And uh, also another a uh, popular example is a structure illumination microscopy. In particular, in a saturated form, it could also break the diffraction limit uh, and then get down to you know, tens of nanometer resolution. And that's pioneered by Moss Gustafson, John Sadat, Dave Agard in US, and Rainer Heinzman in, uh, in uh, Europe. And then there's the second type of approach uh, that is Actually, I'm going to mention the third type because it's not in my slides and then uh, it's uh, relatively new. So generally, I always talk about these two types and the second type is gonna occupy almost my entire talk and I'm gonna forget about. So in recent years, uh, very, very recently, probably in the last couple of years, uh, people actually have developed algorithms uh, to denoise, to correct, and then to also manage to substantially go below the diffraction limit. Now those are so new and how well they work uh, is still something that uh, one has to watch out to see whether they can be generally applied to a uh, real sample to really uh, you know, allow you to extract new information. But because they're so new, I didn't include them in my slides, so I tend to forget them. So before I get to our work, let me just mention that there are algorithmic approaches also to, uh, to hope to uh, break or potentially already breaking the diffraction limit. So the second type of approach should generally take advantage of single molecule imaging. Now we know that uh, this image of a single molecule is diffraction limit, as I mentioned. You know, single molecule is almost a sizeless feature. You know, uh, for uh, for the purpose uh, of speaking here, it's still diffraction limit. It means its width is still a couple of hundred nanometer wide. But nonetheless, in the, in the field of single molecule, it's known for a long time now that you can actually localize uh, the central position of this image it was uh, extraordinarily high precision. And then, uh, a, simply speaking, this is uh, not entirely accurate, but it's approximately right, that this localization precision is the width of the image divided by the square root of the number of photons that you could detect. Now, if you can detect 10,000 photons, you take a square root of that, that's like 100. And then if the width is 200, 200 divided by 100 is two. That means you can localize uh, the molecule extraordinarily precisely with a, you know, one nanometer, two nanometer, you know, generally a few nanometer localization precision. 
However, that alone doesn't break the diffraction limit because the diffraction limit by definition comes in when you have multiple molecules, their images overlap. And this requires you have a well-isolated single molecule images so that you can actually pinpoint a center position. Now when you have two, you know, when you have one, you find the center position in the simplest way by Gaussian fitting, you find the center position. And you say, oh, two, two is no problem. I fit it with two Gaussians. And then I can see whether, you know, where the two centroid positions are. And that is if you know it's two, and that is if it is limited to. What if I don't know how many it is, and it potentially could have several hundred, several thousands, several millions of them. You probably don't go in and then fit this image with uh, millions of uh, Gaussians and then try to find the centroid position because uh, the noise propagation will, uh, will kill you very rapidly. So how do you solve this problem of uh, finding the centroid <coughs> position of the images of individual <coughs> molecules uh, when their if images so heavily overlap, which is the essence of diffraction limit. So that's where we came in. So several years ago, we and others had come up with uh, the idea of uh, you could actually solve this problem by thinking about the fourth dimension, by using the time domain to actually separate things. In other words, you could try not to activate or uh, have all the molecules in your field of view, field of view emitting signal. Only such a small subset that their images are now well isolated from each other. And then you can fit them with a Gaussian or even in more, more sophisticated way and find the centroid positions and turn on the subset and turn on a different subset and then determine their centroid position. And you can iterate this process numerous times, and then often thousands to ten, 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 tens of thousands of times in our experiment until you <clears throat> either exhausted all your molecules, you know, meaning you deter deter determined all their molecular positions in your field of view, or you feel like you determined enough of them so that it actually gives you the, uh, uh, defines the underlying structure with the high definition. Now you could see that now the, local, uh, the, the resolution is no longer limited by the diffraction but by how precise you can localize these molecules, and also for some of these structures, often by how many localizations you get. Because uh, if you have a long polymer chain, and then you only determine two points on it, you really don't have such a good resolution. So uh, the reason that we came up with this is because uh, we actually uh, discovered that some of the fluorescent dyes are photoswitchable. And uh, that means that they have uh, chemically or physically different states. And some of those states are dark, and some of them uh, are actually able to fluoresce. And they're separated by energy barriers. And we found that you could use light to actually convert them across the energy barrier to the bright state. So that means if you use weak enough light, then you can actually activate only a subset stochastically, because only a subset a subset of them can get, actually get across the barrier. So that's why we termed uh, this approach stochastic optical reconstruction microscopy. Because if we activate 0.1%, we actually don't know which 0.1%. And, uh, and the many of you know that uh, independent to our efforts, also almost simultaneously published, our two other teams' uh, work, and one by Eric Besick, uh, uh, Harold Haas, and Jennifer Lippincott Schloss team, and called their approach POM, and the other by uh, Samuel Haas' team, and calls their approach F POM. So here is the application of STORM to this sample. You activate a subset at a time, you pinpoint their center position, and after enough, enough accumulation of these uh, points, this is the storm image you get, and this is for microtubules inside the cell. And in comparison, you can see that this is the conventional diffraction limited image. So without any quantification, you can already appreciate just visually that you have a substantial gain in resolution. I'll give you more quantifications later on. But very quickly, we also realize uh, that uh, you know biological structures are three-dimensional. Most of them are three-dimensional. So we have to break the diffraction limit in all three dimensions and not in the mere two, uh, two dimensions of X and Y. So in principle, or as an advisor speaking, it's easy because we break the diffraction limit in X, Y in storm by determining the X, Y positions of all molecules. So you just have to also <coughs> determine the Z position of all molecules. Then you break the diffraction limit in uh, three dimensions. 
Now in practice, it's slightly easier said than done because when you take an image by your camera, these images uh, really are flat. You know, where is the z-dimension information? It, it, it's actually not that hard if you think through this problem. That's because when you image your sample, you all, you all know that your microscope has this focus knob. And then when you get your sample in focus, you say, oh, I get a nice and sharp image. When they're out of focus, you say, oh, I get a blurrier image. Now at the single molecule uh, level, what does that mean? That means in focus, you get a very small round shape uh, as your image. And out of focus, when it's blurry, the shape got a little bigger, right? In other words, the size of the image or the shape of the image actually encodes the information. It's just not that great because uh, focal point is your local minimum. So that means you're extremely insensitive. You know, when you change focal point, you're changing Z, right? So you're extremely insensitive to Z. And also below and above focus, they generally look identical. So you have this uh, de degeneracy problem. Uh, however, you could actually s solve that problem relatively simply. So in our first implementation of three-dimensional super-resolution imaging, we just inserted a cylindrical lens into the detection path. And then this lens, uh, you know, if you wear glasses, if you have astigmatism, you're most familiar with this because uh, your correction lens is uh, cylindrical. They only bend light in one direction and not the other direction. Now, as a result, uh, most of these single molecule images would look elliptical. And their ellipticity depends very sensitively on the Z position of the mo uh, molecule. And, and uh, uh, very conveniently, both below focus and above focus, they're elongated in two orthogonal directions to break the degeneracy. So with this, we can actually accomplish uh, three-dimensional super-resolution pretty easily by this astigmatism approach. And these are microtubules now imaged with 3D storm. And this is just <coughs> a small area that we uh, zoomed in so that you could see it's uh, all 3D perspective. Now here's some quantification. In this uh, relatively early work, we actually obtained a localization precision that's about 10 nanometer in x, y, and 20 <laughs> nanometer in z, which uh, if you convert to resolution, meaning how far apart features have to be for you to resolve them, 20 nanometer in x, y, and 50 nanometer in z. So if you compare, compare that with actually diffraction limited resolution, it's 10 times better. So if you're an uh, optimistic person, you would say, with a 10 times better view of a biological specimen, I must be able to learn a lot. So let's just go ahead and use that and learn a lot about biology. And if you're a more skeptical person, you say, well, you set up the problem to say that uh, molecules are few nanometer in size. Looks like you're still an order of magnitude off, so there's a lot more to do. So uh, uh, we, we have both of those types in the lab. So some of them go ahead and apply this uh, and then already learn really interesting new biology that I'll share with you. But some of them continue to, uh, to uh, d develop the technology in trying to improve the resolution. And the uh, things I want to uh, leave most of the, you know, some of the time to an entirely new approach, so I'm gonna very quickly mention some of the uh, recent uh, developments in the lab. Now, uh, by inserting the specimen between two objectives, uh, we improved the resolution by twofold, and now it's uh, about 10 nanometer in XY and 20 nanometer in Z. Now, uh, a, a very clever postdoc who had, be before joining my lab, know about this uh, new optical waveform called Airy Beam that doesn't diffract but bend, and then take that, uh, uh, take advantage of that light to localize molecules. Uh, he also solved the problem that you, you notice we always have this anisotropic resolution where Z is a little bit worse, actually twice worse than X, Y. And then uh, he could actually use this new approach to get uh, X, Y, Z isotropic resolution when combined with two objective. Now we have uh, 10 nanometer in all X, Y, Z directions, which is pretty good. Now you can not only deter, uh, improve the resolution by optical means, you could also do that uh, by chemical means because uh, I said at the almost very beginning that the localization precision depends on how many photons you detect. So if you detect more photons, uh, you will be able to improve the resolution. And for a long while, we've been using a series of dyes that we discovered to be photo switchable, and the best of them is uh, pretty well known now, the sci-fi guy for storm imaging, because that's the go-to guy for storm imaging. So, uh, so actually, it was interesting, because so when we discovered it to be photo switching, 
and then apply it to STORM very quickly, I was very optimistic that I could improve the STORM resolution very rapidly. Because I said, you know, because we discovered this photosymmetrical dye by accident, and what are the chances that this accidental discovery is actually the best dye? So I just told my people that uh, if you survey all the dyes and find more photosymmetrical dyes, and chances are, you know, many of them will be better than Phi 5, and you will soon get to your higher resolution, which turned out to be a disappointingly not true. You know, even though it was good that our dye remains the best, uh, the, the record for many years, uh, but improving the resolution along that route hasn't been very productive. Until this post, I thought that, uh, oh, you cannot just do this with uh, surveying existing dyes. Maybe I could invent new ways to make photosymmetrical dye. And then he did that. So he found that uh, you know, a lot of the dyes, this is side three, just as, a, as an illustrative example. If you, put a, uh, if you add a, a reducing reagent to that, you could actually just simply change the chemical structure by adding a single covalent hydrogen bound. <coughs> And then, remarkably, he found that this form is photoactivatable. So if you're shining uh, 400 nanometer light, you can actually reactivate that. And that actually can give you many, many, many more photons than our previous uh, record. So Psi 5, in our previous photoswitchable mechanism that depends on thio, gives you several thousand photons uh, per switching event. This gives you up to millions. Actually, in general, we don't use, even use those so that give you the most photons because it takes forever to switch them off and it takes forever to take the image. So we compromise to take those uh, molecules that give you several hundred thousand photons. Now, several hundred thousand is already two orders of magnitude better than several thousand. So because of that, we could dramatically improve the resolution. So in principle, these dyes should allow you to get down to you know, one to two nanometer resolution. And the reason I emphasize in principle, which also get back to my original statement that we haven't, haven't gotten there yet, is because in practice it also depends, these are just dyes. You know, we need to actually image biological structure. The dye or fluorescent protein needs to be attached to. So you have to attach it to it in a way it's so efficient uh, and then uh, with such a small probe that it could actually uh, benefit from such a uh, resolution. That hasn't been sort of generally accomplished yet, even though there are ways to follow, but the efficiency tend to actually, you, you tend to take a hit and then you get a uh, resolution. That's not the ideal resolution. But, you know, with this uh, potential, we thought we could demonstrate a little bit uh, by cheating, by using not a cellular sample. And then again, we, we look at microtubules, but this time we, uh, these are synthetic microtubules. Uh, these tubulins are actually in vitro assembled into microtubules so that we could label individual tubulins very efficiently with dye. And we no longer worry about resolving neighboring microtubules, so, but we try to get the inner shape of the microtubule, which uh, we, we know is actually a well-known thing. That is, it has an outer diameter of 25 nanometer, inner diameter of 17. Imagine this cylinder to be uniformly decorated with dye. We would imagine each one of these single line should in a projection image look like a doublet. And the peak should be at the inner diameter location, meaning that they should be separated by 17 nanometer. Indeed, you can see their doublet, they're separated by 17 plus minus one nanometer to show you the potential of this, uh, this these dyes if we could actually manage to label the cellular structures with them efficiently. And then, uh, as I said, uh, one of the uh, important merit of light microscopy is the ability to do live cell imaging. And obviously what we want to do live cell dynamics so with STORM, and indeed we can do that with STORM in multicolor, in 3D, you know, uh, and then uh, seeing its dynamics. Uh, and then the resolution that we get for the live cell resolution state of art is roughly a couple of tens of nanometers, 20 nanometer. And with a time resolution, it takes about a second to get these images. And uh, this actually is outdated because there are new cameras that are actually allowed to, uh, to do faster. So about a year after we published our work, uh, there's uh, another lab here actually in Columbia, your beaver storm lab, using exactly our system and our dyes, uh, using the scientific CMOS camera, they could get about 10 times better the speed. Okay, so, th so the field is still rapidly improving and everything is a moving target. 
And of course, was that uh, you could imagine many different kinds of uh, applications uh, that could range from relatively simple uh, biological organisms, such as single cells like this, you know, the, uh, the bacteria cell, where the, in this case we looked at uh, uh, each individual ribosomes and see how they in, uh, distribute it inside the bacteria. And then this is a newer work, which is a, another single cell uh, organism. This is sperm, sperm tail. It was uh, in collaboration with uh, uh, Dave Clapham uh, at Harvard Medical School. We actually discovered this really amazing uh, distribution of uh, a calcium channel in the sperm tail. You see they form these four line structure along the sperm tail. Now exactly what the functional uh, reason for such an organization is still to be discovered. And then uh, that can go from such single, simple organisms uh, all the way to complex brain tissue. And this is a, uh, a, a, a uh, image that we took a few years ago with uh, another uh, colleague, uh, Catherine Dulac, uh, where we look at the synapse structure inside the brain. And these are tissue sizes, actually not cultured cells. And we can not only look at these cytoplasmic structures, we could also look at DNA you know, uh, topology in, in the nucleus. And this is a nice collaboration with the TQ of the Launch Lab at uh, Rockefeller University here, where we look at the T-loop structure. But I'm going <coughs> to focus uh, our application in one of those, because uh, I want to use that to illustrate a point, because in the early days, uh, you know, uh, you often get skeptical people and you show them nice images, they say, nice, what did I learn from that? You know, your images are just sharper. <laughs> so, so I wanted to show you that uh, indeed we can not only get sharper images, so we can even discover structures that people didn't even know existed before inside the cell. And this has to do with acting and neuron. Uh, uh, so so uh, we know that acting is actually a, uh, you know, a, a very important topolymeric structure inside the cell. And in general, it's important for, you know, cell motility, it's important for maintaining uh, cell mechanics, cell shape, and it's important for intracellular transport and so on. But for neuron, there are a couple of additional important uh, um, functions of acting. That has to do with the fact that, that neuron is one of those uh, extremely polarized cells. Means that these processes that are sent out by neuron they're differentiated, and one of them is very long, and that's called axon, and the others are dendrites. And the signal typically in the nervous system propagate along the axon from the axon of uh, one neuron to the dendrites of the uh, targeting neuron. So because of that, uh, you know, this polarization is very important for nervous system function. And acting plays a very important role in that polarization, and it's very important to, for the growth and stabilization of axons. So <coughs> that's what we take a look, uh, because uh, there's very little little knowledge of what acting looks like in axons and dendrites, and that's partly because uh, uh, the resolution issue. You know, the uh, it, it's such a thin structure that it's difficult to resolve. And partly because of the molecular specificity issue, because there are so many different filamentous structures. Now, if you take an EM image of the axon, you would see so many filaments. And the acting being the lightest in terms of its electron density is actually very difficult to trace. So, uh, so I, actually, people always ask me why, after studying the axons for 50 years uh, with microscopy, people didn't discover this structure. So I would give you this reasoning. I don't know whether that's right. <laughs> it's just an imagined reason. Sometimes before you know something exists, it's hard to discover. And once you know it exists, all methods could be used to look at it. So, so we thought that uh, maybe uh, the storm could actually be helpful for us uh, to look at that structure because we have uh, now improved resolution and we can also label it specifically so that it doesn't get uh, swamped by the microtubule and the inter, you know, neurofilament. Uh, uh, backgrounds and so on. So, uh, so this is a specific like floating labeled acting in dendrites, and then you can see these acting filaments. And nothing surprising there really, because uh, what you see are these uh, crisscross uh, mesh work kind of a structure that, uh, as you would expect uh, uh, from cortical acting network. And then it looks like it more or less run along the dendrite as you would expect, because it's a thin tubular structure. So if you so to stretch out your cell surface into a tubular structure, that's what you would expect. expect. 
But the surprise comes uh, when we look at axons. Uh, and then you can see that the structure looks strikingly different. And they look like these, uh, you know, there's still these long filaments running along axons, probably important for axonal transport. But the most prominent features are now these stripes uh, that are go in an orthogonal direction. And obviously, it's hard to see them with conventional light microscopy because this is what you would see. Now, what are they? Uh, since these are actually 3D images, the color actually indicates Z. So we can turn these stripes around, and then they are actually these little rings that wrap around the circumference of the axons. And uh, a very important uh, property of this, as you can even notice by eye, is they're so regularly spaced. It's so remarkably spaced that we found that we could actually stretch out this computationally and project into one dimension, do a Fourier transform, and this is the Fourier transform that you could get. You can only get these uh, uh, primary uh, peaks and you even get the harmonic overtones uh, showing you that it's really an extraordinarily periodic structure. And uh, <coughs> the periodicity is about 180 nanometer. And uh, I, I emphasize this number because it's actually this number that gave us some clue of what this structure might be made of. Because the first thing you see this uh, periodic structure, you would imagine there might be a spacer there that actually is separating these uh, acting structure, right? What could be the spacer molecule? And this 180 nanometer give us the clue. And that uh, led us to think of this molecule called spectrum. Now, uh, spectrum tetramer has a length of about 180, 190, 200 nanometer, which fits the bill. But uh, you know, the best that, there's another reason that made us think of that. And the best that we know about spectrum in terms of its ultra-structure organization is in red blood cells. Underneath the red blood cell membrane is a triangular network structure. And this uh, network structure, the arms are made of spectrum tetramer, but at the nodes are actually these little acting filaments. And spectrum can actually directly interact with that. So in other words, a spectrum can have the potential to connect acting filaments, right? So with these two in mind, then we hypothesize that this kind of a structure. So the ring we see, you know, in analogy to this little uh, acting filament in red blood cell, we imagine it to be little acting filaments that are somehow aligned, we still don't know how they're aligned, into a ring structure. But the reason they're periodically spaced is because uh, they're separated by the spectrum now, with that in mind, you can actually uh, test this hypothesis with super-resolution stone imaging. You just have to do multiple molecular components simultaneously, right? So imagine you can image spectrum. Imagine you can not only image spectrum, <coughs> but you can image specific location of the spectrum. Say we can image the center position of the tetramer. Now, then we should imagine together with acting, they should form alternating green and magenta rings, right? And that indeed turned out to be true. So if you label the central portion of the spectrum tetramer, image it together with acting, you see these alternating rings. And you take any portion of it, you take a projection. It's beautifully alternating. Now go back to this structure, you can say, well, if these are not long acting filament bending, but short acting filaments, these short acting filaments need to be capped. Now in red blood cell, they're capped by proteins like aducin. So if aducin also exists in this structure, they should co-align with acting. And that also turned out to be true. You can see aducin acting there co-aligned. Now with that, you can then infer that aducin in the central portion of spectrum must alternate, and indeed they do alternate. So this is a really a pretty remarkable structure in terms of its prevalency. You know, this is an entire storm field of view, uh, uncropped, other than this middle process, which we know is uh, dendrite because it's MAC2 positive. Every single axon we see actually have this uh, periodic structure. Now, uh, if you uh, do neurobiology, and then looking at this image, you actually immediately notice uh, that this is actually just cultured neurons. They're not uh, brain tissue. And neurobiologists tend to worry about cultured neurons. And so are our reviewers. So when they review our manuscript, they said, oh, this looks great. It, it's potentially paradigm shifting. This is a stunning, breathtaking image. But I worry about the whole thing being an artifact because these are culture neurons, so it's, it could be culturing artifact. You have to show that it exists in brain tissue. So 
So indeed, we had to do that. So, so we did that. This is a brain tissue slice that you cut and you image spectrum. And you can see this beautiful periodic structure. And then you can actually take its periodicity. It's about the same. And the same reviewer said, uh, oh, these are fixed cells. I also worry that it's fixation <laughs> artifact. So, uh, so, so it was a little bit harder for us to imagine it to be a fixation artifact because it's so beautiful and then also at molecular level everything makes sense. So, so we managed to convince uh, the editor and the and the reviewer. But indeed, uh, you know, the, the the desire to do this in live neuron is nonetheless correct because if you could do in live neuron. You could rest, you know, this concern. You could also potentially see uh, see uh, dynamics, and so uh, so I did push my people to do that. And then after quite a bit of an effort, we do see this in live neurons. Now we see that in live neurons by a couple of different uh, labeling schemes. I'll just show you one here, and that is the spectrum that we actually fuse it to a photoactivatable fluorescent protein. And then a, a student, a postdoc in the lab, developed a really nice photoactivatable fluorescent protein that's much more efficient than before. So that actually allow us to see these beautiful ladder structure in live neurons. <coughs> but I didn't bother to show you movies because uh, the image looks just the same as movies. Uh, the disappointing part is we didn't see dynamics. But nonetheless, it's still the beginning because these are all resting neurons. We didn't stimulate them. We didn't look at them in you know under behavior and so on. So. So it's possibly there are interesting dynamics that we could see by uh, studying under those conditions. And then I'll skip that because I know I'm a little slow on this part. But I'll just, uh, uh, before I move on to this new method, uh, uh, share with you a little bit of our uh, newest understanding of uh, you know, why is there such a striking difference between axons and dendrites. You know, these are both tubular structures and so on. And, uh, and they first, let me first quantify what the difference is in axons and dendrites in terms of this periodic structure. So if you look at the beta spectrum, and then if you look at these uh, culture neurons, in the early days, early developmental stage, such as you put the neurons uh, in vivo for two days, you begin to see these periodic structures in axons, but not in dendrites. And here's a different to quantitative analysis. Instead of doing Fourier transform, we took autocorrelation. We can see this periodic peaks, and we don't see that in dendrites. And by the time it's day five, uh, after three days, uh, compared to this sample, you can see many more of the structures uh, in axons, but still not in dendrites. As you can see, this uh, autocorrelation gets even sharper in terms of uh, higher in terms of peaks, but still flat here in dendrites. Interestingly, by the time you get to relatively mature neuron, like day 14, you actually begin to see some of these periodic structures also in dendrite. These are individual examples. In this particular like, picked example, in this local region, the dendrite almost look as well as axons. But that's the minority. The majority of the axon of dendrites do not have the structure. And if you find dendrites to have the structure, it tends to not extend throughout the entire dendrite, while axon, it tends to be very coherently going from the beginning all the way to the end of axons, spare the growth cone. So if you quantify it over, you know, this, the reason we, do, we use this autocorrelation is because it allows us to add, uh, you know, the signal of <coughs> many, many dendrites and many, many <coughs> axons. And then you can see the quantitative difference. In early developmental stage, you only see it in dendrites. In the mature neurons, uh, you start to see it also in dendrites, and in, uh, you see it in axons, but also in dendrites. But after over uh, averaging over many dendrites, you can see the amplitude to be much worse because only a small fraction of dendrites have this, and when they have it, they tend to be not very coherently long. And that you can see it over other. And then I want to show you that similar finding was also made by another lab. And uh, that's Stefan Hell's lab, uh, you know, in a later paper uh, compared to what I showed you uh, in the previous slide, they pretty much saw the same thing. And that is that uh, they saw periodic acting structure in 20% of dendrites, but in all axons. And then in dendrites, they tend to, in axons, they tend to sort of spend through the entire axons and so on. So what's making this difference? And uh, that was another <laughs> accidental discovery because it just turned out that our original <coughs> hypothesis was wrong. And uh, we, we originally thought that there's this molecule uh, called anchoring B that are uh, known to actually 
link spectrum to the membrane. And then we know that it, it's enriched in axons. So potentially, if that is enriched in axons, that could be bringing the structure to axons. So the idea was that if we delete this molecule, then we would be able to get rid of the axonal structure. And so we contacted Ben Bennett, who very nicely uh, provided us their anchoring D knockout mouse and you know, made sample already and for us the image. But uh, uh, you know, to our disappointment, these, these beautiful axon structures are still there. But the, the students uh, uh, and POSA who did this work were very observant. They noticed the one thing, even though this beautiful axonal structure is still there, when they look at dendrites, they found that the structure now becomes really also there in every single dendrite. Now the dendrite periodicity or regularity looks just as good as axons by deleting this anchoring B molecule. So that must have something to do with uh, you know, selectively putting this structure <coughs> in axons. It's just not the way that we originally envisioned. Now, to their credit, these are really observant students and postdocs, and they, they, they said, oh, and they not only observed this, but in dendrite, they also noticed one thing, and that is <coughs> if they look at the beta spectrum, uh, I, this is a wrong label, sorry. This is MAP2. MAP2 seem, it tells you that these are actually dendrites. These are not beta-4 spectrum. That's very wrong. This is a beta-4 spectrum. It's not in dendrite. So, uh, so they also notice one thing, that is beta-2 spectrum originally in wild-type neurons are enriched in axons by twofold, only twofold actually. But when you knock out anchoring B, they're evenly distributed in all axons and dendrite. So then this uh, student, John, he then made the hypothesis to say that, uh, okay, so it must be anchoring B that actually somehow kept uh, beta spectrum in axons more than in dendrites. And that's why the uh, local concentration of beta spectrum made the structure exist more in axons than in dendrites. He said, now if I just overexpress beta spectrum, I put, if I put a lot more beta spectrum into the cell, I should be able to induce structure in dendrites. And lo and behold, uh, he, after overexpressing, ex uh, overexpression of beta 2 spectrum, he now get every single dendrite to have this periodic structure and these are the Fourier transform. So with that, uh, you know, uh, I just want to conclude this part not by repeating what the structure is uh, because it's quite clear to people what it is now. But most people are unclear about uh, what does it do as we are because uh, why, why do nature make such a beautiful, elegant structure in the axons? Indeed, so what does it help us with, right? So that remains a big question. So we have a couple of hypotheses uh, that have some basis, uh, but really they're unproven hypotheses that we need to test. And one is, uh, uh, you know, this is right underneath the axonal membrane. Now, if you again take inspiration from the red blood cell structure, the red blood cell structure enter many important functional membrane proteins, like channels on the membrane. So we envision this structure would also anchor many important uh, membrane proteins on the axons, like channels. And ion channels are clearly very important for axonal function. You know, some of them are actually important for generation of action potential, and some are important for act, uh, propagation of action potential. And indeed, sodium channel, which is important for generation of action potential, we found it to be uh, periodically spaced. And we now found more channel molecules on the axon to be periodically spaced. So what we wonder this periodic spacing, whether it actually influenced the signaling along axons, so both the electrical signaling and other signaling. And now the other, the other function is uh, you know, even uh, you know, uh, a little bit more fun, because uh, that's, that's what you could imagine. So I brought this. So spectrum is known to be a really flexible molecule. So you could imagine that uh, what this structure does uh, is it afford a support that is both robust and elastic, which might be what axons need, right? So because uh, axons, you know, have to bend, have to meander through a really complex tissue environment, and when you move around, you know, you are applying mechanical stress to the axons and you don't want them to break. And for such a thing, extraordinarily thin and long structure, 
and it really, you know, you, it, it's easy to break. So maybe this structure actually provides the mechanical strength to the axons to prevent it. To, they can bend it, but don't just won't destroy it, right? So that, but that, that's actually not just imagination. <laughs> so this is a, you know, I, I always bring this. This is actually a toy of my uh, young daughter. So she, she got it when she was one year old. Now she grew out of it because she's already five. But she, she doesn't get interested in that kind of thing anymore. <laughs> it's all about frozen now. If you know <laughs> what I'm talking about. So uh, Elsa and Anna. Uh, so. Uh, they get back to science. I say it's not all imagination because even before our discovery of this structure, there's a lab uh, in Utah, Eric Jurgensen's lab. They actually knock out spectrum from C. elegans. And then the, 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 the phenotype they found is uh, the, uh, the axons tend to break you know, in C. elegans. But if they paralyze these, these animals so that they cannot move and yet still mature and grow, the axon can actually grow into a normal morphology. So apparently this molecule is important to, for counter the mechanical stress, the stress as the animal move. And we think it's probably the structure that does it. So there are experiments going on to test that. So with that, uh, I do want to give you the option of, uh, you know, I could skip this part if you think I, I, I talk too much already. And, uh, no. Okay. So, so then <laughs> I get a chance to share with you our latest excitement, which I'm really excited about it. And uh, you can see that I actually don't even have citation here yet because the paper came out uh, last Thursday in Science. So if you're interested in details, which I cannot cover that all, and then you can actually read that uh, research article. So it's all about the, the need to do spatially resolved transcriptomics. So now we know that transcriptomics is, uh, it, you know, it really give us uh, a uh, an explosion of knowledge about different cells. You know, what are, you know, what are, how are the cell fate developed, and you know, what are the, the different types of cells, and how are they related to their function? Because usually, because they have the same genome, right? But different genes are expressed to different level, and those are first manifested in their transcripts, right? So by measuring the transcriptome, then you can actually see different cell type and see why they are linked to their different function. And then if the animal develop, you know, how do you go from embryo, which is identical to the different cell types? So, and then uh, people uh, also found that because of that, even within the same population of cells and cell types, they found that the transcriptomes could actually be different. So there are many ways, many needs to do it at the single cell level differentiate cell by cell to see the transcription program, how they're different. And that's actually doable. You know, there are single cell transcriptomics approach by the next gen sequencing to do that. Uh, but spatially resolved, why do we want to do it spatially resolved? You know, you take a complicated cell as an example. Their transcripts are not just uniformly distributed everywhere. For example, in neurons, it's known that some transcripts are preferentially in the dendrites near the dendritic spine where synapses function so that so when you actually stimulate the neuron and you want to strengthen that synapse, presumably maybe for forming some memory, uh, it's the local transcription there that actually gets you those changes uh, most quickly. And that's just one example. So, so there are many different cells uh, that people kn know that there are different uh, spatial organization of the transcripts. So you want to do that. Not only that, if you get to the tissue level, as I said, there are so many different types of cells, and you want to differentiate them. First, find out how many different types there are. Now, one of the major goal of the brain initiative is to find out how many cell types are in the brain. Now, if you dissociate that, I talked to my neurobiologist friend, and if you dissociate that, you can actually eliminate the differences in their transcription program between these, because the native environment is important for maintaining this, right? So you don't want to dissociate to do the single cell sequencing. Then, you know, spatially resolved one, how do you deal with that, right? And then that would potentially give you in situ cell type identification, cell fate development, and so on. And then eventually, uh, as other, you know, uh, single cell transcriptomist approach can do, as I will demonstrate here too. You know, if you actually can do it cell by cell, you can see that from cell to cell, how do the gene expression level co-vary among different genes? That means they tend to be co-regulated. That actually allows you to describe <coughs> 
describe, uh, discover gene regulatory networks and so on. So how do you do spatially resolved thing? Imaging is probably one of the most straightforward way one could think of. You could also think about, I cut this tissue into tiny little pieces, and I remember where they come from, and I do that. People do do that. But if you could do an imaging approach, it probably is more advantageous so than you know, cutting you know, pieces and trying to remember where they come from. So how do you do an imaging transcriptome? Uh, how do you do imaging transcriptome? Uh, so, so you know, let's say the human transcriptome, 20,000 <coughs> different RNAs. And the, the, if you do it by fish, they're actually possible that you can generate 20,000 different types or 100,000 different types of oligos to actually differentially label these transcripts. The problem is that if you read out them simultaneously, you cannot have 20,000 different colors to actually let them distinguish them, right? <coughs> now you say, well, but I can do it maybe one at a time. You know, I do one and I do transcript two, I do transcript three, and then I just keep washing and replenishing after 20,000 times I build a, a reconstructed sample. If you have the patience, the cell doesn't have that patience because it degrades so much even after fixation. That's also infeasible. So how do you do that? So we got very excited when I came up with this idea that we could do it with a combinatorial approach. So that is, uh, what that means is, let's say we still do it in multiple rounds. But in each round, I don't just image one transcript at a time. I image a combination of them. And I, I designed the combination you know, this way to, to make it simple to understand that uh, in the first round, you know, first I encode all these RNAs with these uh, 101010 kind of uh, information string bits, okay? So we borrow a lot of information technology in doing this. So then each RNA has a binary code. Now only those RNA that should read one in the first round will be labeled and imaged in the first round. And then we kill this fluorophores by photobleaching. And then we add more fluorophores uh, or more oligos. And those oligos so linked to fluorophores are only going to hybridize with those RNAs uh, that read one in the second bit. And then we get them. And then we iterate this process. Now imagine how many you can get by this. Math is really great here. And that is, uh, imagine that I do the simplest scheme. <laughs> now in the first round, I address every single RNA. In the second round, I address every single RNA but one. In the third round, and so on and so forth. In the end, your, your, your RNAs would read one, zero, 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 one, zero, 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 and so on, right? And then let's say if you do two ends, uh, two uh, n rounds. Then how many how many different codes there are? Some people probably could tell me immediately. Because each bit have a chance have two possibilities. After n bits, how many possibilities? <laughs> two to the n, right? And except to that zero 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 <coughs> is nothing to us because we don't detect anything. It might as well be a code or a nothing there. So two to the n not minus one. Now that's very powerful because two to the 16 minus one is already 60,000. So instead of having to do 60,000 rounds, I only need to do 16 rounds. Then I can already distinguish them. That's the power of this combinatorial approach. Except, uh, and then I, why, why do I do 60? Because that's the entire human transcriptome. Except that this picture is way too rosy to be true. <laughs> so the reason is uh, 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 less trivial to think of is even though the number scale is so favorable, two to the n minus one, the error scale is very unfavorably because that there isn't anything called error-free detection. Even for RNA fish, which you put a lot of probes on it, you can detect at the single molecule level. And uh, Rob Singer here at Albert Einstein in New York actually pioneered that. And then there are many years of effort to make that detection remarkably accurate. As accurate as say, you could be 95% accurate in each round or 90% accurate in each round. But there's still five to 10% error. For one round detection, that's no problem. Now when you do the second round, that adds up. By the time you do 16 rounds, it's as if you have 8% error times 16. Then you get no, no truth left. So basically, 
you know, by the time you do 16 rounds, your detection efficiency drops very low, and more importantly, the vast majority of the RNAs are misread. You're actually reading garbage <coughs> rather than reading anything useful. Now here, again, is where information theory can help us, because the same problem has been solved in IP technology already, because uh, all our emails and all these things are transmitted by these 1010 bits. Every bit has a chance of having error. They do much more than 16 bits. How do we keep us from reading you know, correct emails rather than double emails? Is because they worked out an error-robust scheme. So, uh, so these error-robust encoding, one of them I'll use this Hemi encoding to explain. So what they do is uh, they don't use all the two to the n minus one codes to, include, uh, to encode information. They choose a subset of those codes and each one of them are separate from all the other ones by more than one bit of error. You know, in the previous case, one bit error convert one message to the other. Now here, you need more than one bit of error to convert one valid code to the other. If I choose a Hamming distance to be equal to four, that means you have to make simultaneously four errors in one message to actually make it wrong. And that means uh, it's much harder to do, right? So not only that, if, if you do make an error, you can actually know that it is an error because it's not a valid code. Not only you know it's an error, you actually can correct that error because a one bit error is uniquely close to one valid code because it is at least three errors away from all the other codes. So and a double error is no longer correctable, but you can still identify that. So with that, we can actually reduce uh, the, uh, the, uh, the error to, to this much. The, deficient, the efficiency of detection drops more slowly compared to this, and this misidentification code rises uh, also uh, more slowly. But now we take advantage of another thing, is doing fish, we know that it's actually much easier to make a one to zero error. Means I didn't detect that molecule. Rather than a zero to one error, means I read nothing, or something out of nothing. So because of that, we actually can you know, deliberately keep the number of ones small so that one to zero conversions have a smaller chance. And then we, we call this modified Hammond distance code. And then with this modified Hammond distance code, you can see I indeed lost some in my scaling. But it's, it's well worth it because I have almost no error also left. I can then trust what I read. So my students uh, give it a fun name. And they call it uh, multiplexed error robust uh, fluorescence in situ hybridization, which is Murfish. I actually don't really quite like the name because I felt like uh, this is such a nice method. I don't want it to be necessarily <laughs> associated with a uh, monster that has a fish head and then a human legs. But nonetheless, uh, that's Murfish in the paper already. So, uh, so the name probably sticks. So this is actually a real experiment, hybridization one hybridization two and so on using our Murfish uh, error robust encoding and after 16 rounds uh, you can see you know the uh, this, this is to image 140 genes simultaneously and then now uh, we color code these RNAs so, so that uh, you know they're color coded according to their codes and then uh, I'm going to skip a lot of analysis just to show you that we have a detection efficiency of 80 percent because of this error correction but very importantly misidentification was kept below 10 percent and uh, I, I although I won't show you how these numbers come from I will make you believe that that's true by comparing with existing technology so uh, although single molecule fish cannot be used to image so many molecules uh, so many genes they can be used to image one at a time right so we actually picked 15 out of the 140 to do single molecule fish one at a time and then it's known to have 90% accuracy and compared to our Murfish measurement. And you can see that they're basically spot on and bleeding uh, with uh, no systematic deviation. And then we can also do bulk sequencing. You know, even though these are single molecule approaches, I could average many, many molecules and compare to bulk sequencing, and then we get this extraordinary correlation with the bulk sequencing. Now with that, we can actually indeed study things so like uh, uh, different spatial organizations. Even in this 140 genes, we found the two different uh, distribution patterns of messages uh, 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 for two groups of the 140 genes. Uh, and one of them actually liked to be near the cell periphery, and we found them to be the uh, ER 
uh, associated genes. It means that these genes uh, tend to be membrane or secretory proteins uh, and they're translated at DR. And that's why they tend to have the paranuclear distribution. And another one that's much more non-trivial, we found uh, nearly 20 genes uh, to like to be at the cell periphery and they're related to actin cytoskeleton. And previously, Rob Singer showed that actin, you know, beta actin messages tend to be at the cell periphery, and then a few others. And now, in one shot of the experiment, we inc increase that number to, to 20. Okay. And then now uh, we can actually use uh, the uh, the cell to cell variation, as I mentioned to you, to to look at the regulatory networks. Uh, and uh, I see my timing is. Uh, not so good, so I won't, I won't go into details. I'll be happy to discuss over question period. But by doing that, we actually discovered or, or uh, you know, revealed uh, four, seven different groups of co-regulated genes by just measuring 140 genes. And then, uh, and then, of course, you can see that it doesn't stop there. You could measure many more. I set up the problem as we could measure 20,000. Again, I want to tell you that this is a progress report. We haven't reached 20,000 yet, but I'll show you 1,000. 1,000, you could actually do it in different ways. You know, in our most accurate code, which is a modified Hamming distance four code, uh, you know, we just have to increase that 16 rounds to 32 rounds. Then we can do actually 1,200 genes. And uh, we could also maintain only 16 rounds, but do two color in each round. Two color imaging is trivial, so we can also do that. But I want to show you an even simpler way. And the simpler way is to relax a little bit on the error correction. Let's say we now do a having this distance two code so that there's only ability to detect error but no longer correct error. Now with that, I can do it with single color, 14 rounds of hybridization. I can detect 1,001 genes. And then, uh, and then here's the performance after you do that. And I'll just share with you here. You know, you can see that the measurement still correlates very well with single molecule vision <coughs> bulk sequencing, but because we can no longer correct error, those things that are deemed as errors are all discarded. So our detection efficiency is only one third of this uh, better code, but it's easier to do, right? And with that, uh, we, we measured 1,001 genes, and we actually uh, discovered 100 uh, uh, groups of co-regulated genes, which each one of them has some unknown genes so that actually allow us to, in one shot of the experiment, predict function for 100 genes. Of course, each one of these predictions need to be tested later on. So, so here's my uh, rosy picture for the future. But I actually think it's, uh, it should be quite feasible, and that is uh, with this H MHD4 code. I'm not going to talk about MHD2 because the error probably makes, uh, makes the scaling towards 10,000 more difficult. But uh, with the MHD4 code, with 14 bit, I just need to do one twist to get to many more numbers. You know, I you remember I said we kept the number of ones per code small. Uh, how small? We have four ones per per 16 bit code. I just have to change that four to six. That would encode 27,000 genes, which is the human transcriptome scale. And we do think that is feasible. And uh, perhaps uh, somewhere, you know, the density is going to cause some problem because all and if you all of a sudden image many more RNAs, can you still resolve them? But the good news is that I showed everything there with conventional imaging. I haven't even used STORM yet. So we think that with STORM super resolution imaging, 100% of transcription should be possible. With that, of course, uh, uh, we uh, can you know, apply those to learn. Even 1,000, we already apply those to learn uh, you know, the spatial organizations of transcripts uh, in, the, in the cell uh, or in tissue to understand cell type and cell fate development and so on. So with that, I can just conclude by uh, thanking the people who has done the work. And the, the, the development of STORM is really a, uh, a team effort by many talented individuals. And the early work is due to Bo Huang, as I has mentioned already, and Mike Gross and Mark Bates, uh, and then some of the newer developments like the Super Bright Guy by Josh Wong and uh, the life cell imaging by Sarah Jones and Sun Hei Shim, and the error beam approach by uh, Xu Jia. And, uh, but I want to uh, give special credit to, to the two topics that I emphasized today. One is the discovery of the, uh, of the periodic ring structure as due to a former postdoc, Ke Xu, who is now a, a, a assistant professor at UC Berkeley together with Guixin Zhang 
And the, 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 the understanding of why axon band drives are different <coughs> is due to a really talented uh, graduate student, He Jiang, who is about to graduate. And the, the uh, Anchoring B collaboration with Ben Bennett was instrumental in, in that uh, work. And the, the, uh, the Murfish work is uh, you know, really a super talented team, graduate student Kao Hao Chen, who is defending this month, together with uh, postdoc uh, Jeff uh, Moffat and uh, Alice Dribble Heger and uh, Stephen Wan. And the work is uh, primarily supported by uh, Howard Hughes, NIH, and DOD. And thank you very much. <laughs>